thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Now, disease has been with us forever, of course, but it's only in the most recent centuries we've gained any sort of insight into the way it actually works, pathogens and transmission. It's little wonder, therefore, that the idea of contagion and infection is such a spectre to us, from fiction to fact, all the things from the bite of a vampire to reassortant influenza viruses. We have some wonderful people here today, supported by the Wellcome Trust, to talk about disease in fact and fiction, what's real, what isn't, and whether it matters. The idea of infection plays very large in horror. We have vampires infecting people. We, of course, have the ever omnipresent and popular zombies appearing in just about everything. And even you could say like werewolves, pod people, the thing, and so forth all involve this idea of infection and contagion. Why is that such an effective trope? It wasn't so long ago that us and our society was, was ravaged by it, by, by plague and by, uh, by just all these mysterious things that we, did, we couldn't comprehend. And I think that um, these, these infection horror, I think it gives us a safe taster of, of what it used to be like and uh, what uh, you know, almost sort of taps into us at a quite, a, quite a primal kind of kind of level. It's the only thing that can really fuck humanity as a species now is some kind of disease. I mean, yes, you can have something which can negatively impact a lot of the population, but diseases just keep on spreading. We're so connected as a world. It's more than anything else. It's some, it's the it's the extinction sort of style event for humanity. So, I'd say that has also got that kind of oh shit, this kind of thing could really happen, kind of vibe to it. There's a textbook on mathematical biology which got me into disease dynamics. And one section of it is about modelling rabies in wildlife populations. And there's a tiny little subsection which got me hooked, which was arguing that vampire legends are because of rabies. People trying to absorb rabies. So could that be the case? Are these zombie stories and vampires about us trying to deal with idea of epidemics. Humans always try to rationalise things and explain things and if you don't have the understanding of some kind of bacterium which can be causing this and yeah you're going to think of what's the next most logical explanation oh it's a bloody werewolf running around. And I mean that idea still occasionally it crops up where they talk about migrants bringing in disease and so forth so you know it's it's a it's very good uh, demonising otherising device. One of the reasons why uh, infections are used so widely into, in fiction is because it's a powerful metaphor. It's really the idea of uh, the danger that comes from inside. Uh, you know, the insider, this is something you can control. Uh, this is something you can apply to any context. I think a classic example is, uh, uh, you know, the Cold War paranoia in, uh, you know, B-movies, um, all this kind of thing, like the, you know, the, 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 the threat that is uh, crawling within your population. You don't know who your neighbors are. With all these games about the end of the world and infection and so forth, uh, are they making us perhaps a little bit too used to apocalypse? Okay, are we getting used to the end of the world? It's just becoming a bit of a humdrum thing. Or is that actually hiding these ideas from us? Humans have always been interested in end of the world style scenarios. You get that in movies, you get that in books, you get that in games. I think. So talking very much from a point of view of Plague Inc, which is, is sort of the opposite of the film Contagion, you're the, you're the disease instead, <laughs> it, it's, it lets people get into the mindset of a back, I mean, it's not a mindset, but it lets, it lets them understand, get a perspective into a disease that they wouldn't normally get. And so, yes, maybe it makes them a little more, maybe it de de desensitizes them a little bit, but I think it also it teaches them about how a disease works. And I get people getting in touch with me saying, oh, my little kids have started washing their hands, or, or, or you should like sponsor some kind of hand sanitizer, and you can like do a plague ink branded hand sanitizer. <laughs> like, because it makes people think, shit, like, I just wiped out the world because I evolved a disease and it did something. Now, I've seen the news that there's always worry about bird flu maybe mutating. Fuck, if, that, if it mutates, then that could happen, something, something like plaguing could happen. So it, it helps people understand a very complex, very, very detailed subject a little bit, and it maybe makes them change their actions slightly as a result, which is a good thing, even if it does desensitize them to people dying, which I think happens in media already. I think the same way that when contemporary audiences were reading something like Robinson Crusoe, uh, I think it's this, the same kind of thing. It's that it's the uh, 
how much can you depend on yourself and your own skills and, 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 what, and what, you, what you learn. That's the thrill of it, that, that safe taster of what things could be if the very fragile thing we call society, call society just evaporated. In general, zombies in games, they're quite a safe enemy. There's no, you don't need to worry about racism or about sexism or about anything. They're just, these are bad things and you can kill them. So there's no like mental stress that you need to worry about here. Am I doing the right thing or not? You just, yeah, I'm killing zombies. That's good. I don't think zombies are necessarily bad because they be there's just you in the future, mm. right? So they just tell you something about yourself. They finally give you a good excuse to hate other human beings. You can finally hate your neighbors and your mother in law <laughs> yeah. and that's perfectly fine. Does the science actually really matter for a game? I mean, is it of concern? Should the science be good? Should it be plausible? Or is it not of relevance at all? If you want the game to be fun, let's suppose this is the only thing we want to achieve, it's a fun game. Okay. Then it doesn't have to be realistic. It doesn't have to be an epidemic. But on the other hand, if you take epidemic dynamics, it's interesting, right? If you take the natural dynamics, you could create many fun things out of it. I've played Plague Inc and I love it. Okay. Yesterday morning, I was out in pathology talking with someone about HIV. Scared level zero. Mm. In the afternoon, I was working on my 2009 influenza data, which is about how it spread spatially. Not scared at all. Mm. And I thought, in preparation for today, I'd have a quick play with Project Zomboid. And I booted it up half an hour before, well, I thought half an hour before going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I was traumatised. <laughs> it was a late night. I was very scared. <laughs> the training in disease dynamics did not help. <laughs> What would be your, your favourite or what you think is the most interesting or influential bit of media or fiction that's about the subject of contagion and disease? Probably uh, I Am Legend. Everything that, about the whole uh, how would you cope if everybody else um, sort of um, all of a sudden were, 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 were taken out. The way that it, it, it develops and the way that, um, the way that society does carry on to a, to, to a degree uh, I just think it's a re really interesting way, way, way of looking at it. There's a book called Death of Grass by John Christopher, yes. which is a phenomenal book. I can remember reading that when I was I don't know, 14 or something maybe. And <coughs> it just it, it captures these people. There's a disease spreading across the world and it's wiping out, I think, wheat and stuff. And then humanity <coughs> tries to cure it by releasing a, a competing version. And it starts off being wonderful and then it mutates and now it's wiping out all plant matter, I think except for potatoes. And then, and so you've got this country which is just, or the world, all plant matter is dying off and these people are trying to survive in it. And it's, it's kind of a very low tech story. Um, but it has a similar kind of stuff like that you get the motorways being barricaded by the army, nuclear bombs dropped somewhere in the UK and people don't know what's going on. And it's a very powerful kind of emotional, emo emotive story, even though it's actually, it's not very long, but it just, it, it was one of the first ones I can really remember which really conveyed that kind of infection and disease. Even though it didn't affect humans, it, it doesn't need to infect humans. If it destroys everything you're eating, then you're still in a bit of trouble. Which is the siege of Krishnapur, J.G. Farrell. Oh, must have been written about 20 years ago. So it's set in uh, mid 19th century, I've got this right. It's in India, um, sort of colonial times, and a slightly ridiculous society. Um, and there's a siege, there's rebellion. And in the middle of all this, cholera piles in. And this is sort of how I would picture a really awful outbreak. It's not just sort of, world is going around normal, then disease appears. There are many, many other things going on, and it appears to be a side issue at first. And it comes in, it just gets worse, and then society, ridiculous society, breaks down. It just gets more and more horrible. And it's sort of humorous and completely scary at the same time. In my opinion, the best um, film about an epidemic um, is uh, uh, The Social Network, uh, which, is, <laughs> which is about uh, a real-life uh, zombie virus, <laughs> which is probably the most successful epidemic or pandemic that the humankind has ever seen. Like one billion people infected over 10 years. I mean, just picture that. Surely we've had enough of zombies by now. We've got zombies in everything. It's only a matter of time before they end up in our cereal. I know you've, you've spoken very strongly for how useful they are for games, but is there not a point that we have reached that this has to be enough? I, uh, I actually looked up on IMDb how many films with zombies in it were produced last year, and the answer is 84. <laughs> Um, not all of them good, I think. I think the thing is that um, zombies themselves, that a zombie is, is a boring monster. They, they, they don't do very much. They shamble around. For a lot of time they've been abused in games in the sense that 
They're quite fun to shoot. They're the early, they're the early baddies. Bits fall off them. They're only very complicated AI. You know, it's just that and that. That's why. But the thing about in in the apocalyptic scenario with the hordes and and all that business, they're all of us. All of a sudden, they're. They're, 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 they're the threat, and the things that are interesting in, the, in that world aren't the zombies, it's the survivors. And it's the survivors and the fact that it's all these people, and this, this, is, this is Romero, is what, is, you know, this, is what, this is what he did, it's people from different cultures, backgrounds, wealth, race, just all thrown, thrown together, and it's not, and you are looking at people surviving, getting on together in the extraordinary, extraordinary circumstances. And in, add into that all the, the family dramas and things like that, and that, that's what's that's what's interesting about zombie apocalypse is it's the, it's, it's the people and that's why I mean people everywhere on every thread below uh, whenever our games mentioned or anything that's got zombies in the name people are oh, so bored of zombies so bored of zombies uh, I don't think we ever get enough of zombies because it's, uh, it's such a convenient symbol it's, mm -hmm. it's a universal model right that you can apply in too many contexts uh, just to take one I think this is the ultimate um, political symbol just looking at Romero because you mentioned him uh, you look at all these films, you know, the, the, the crucial ones, whatever crucial. Um, so what, Day of the Dead, no sorry, Dawn of the Dead, you know, he's set in a shopping mall in the 70s. And what it's about, it's really about, you know, the consumer society of this time. Uh, the next one, Day of the Dead, you know, it's in a bunker. It's a clearly an anti-militaristic anti um, film. Uh, Land of the Dead, you know, 2005, I think. This is a post-Katrina paranoia thing, maybe even post 9-11, God knows. So you can put so many things inside that, uh, you know, you, I think uh, it will always be tempting to use uh, zombies as a model. Gentlemen over there want to say something? Uh, if you want to go back to the original Romero, uh, Night of the Living Dead, with the radiation concerns, which are much more prevalent in the 1960s, extremely low frequency electromagnetic radiation can be used to amplify nervous impulses that are below what would conventionally be required for firing. Mm -hmm. And if you had that as a persistent state, then you could make some very hand wavy articulations about where energy would be coming <laughs> from and right up until bacteria get in and start eating your host like they're going to do anyway, you can animate dead tissue in muscle contraction ways for a period of time. Uh, the original zombie figure, right, the voodoo type, mm. is, uh, what is it? It's, uh, it's a slave, mm -hmm. okay, who's completely under the power of a master, mm. okay? So you can clearly see the, the image of uh, the working class being oppressed, you know, by the ruling class, blah, blah, blah. And then comes Romero and exits the zombie master, and what you have is a herd of independent people who have no god, no master, okay? This, they, they've broken their shackles. This is so it's like a slave revolt. This is the socialist yeah. dream. And in Land of, Land of the Dead again, okay, what do we have? We've got this figure of the zombie boss, who's basically Spartacus. <laughs> the guy who leads the, uh, who leads the, uh, the free slaves. I think this yeah. is a pretty clear. In the front there? Um, yeah, I wondered if we could um, go back to talking about zombies and socialism. Because it's, <laughs> <laughs> it, no, it's actually, there is quite a lot of scholarship on this recently, okay. and a lot of people writing um, quite, quite intelligently about the idea of the, the power of the zombie narrative as a class war narrative, as the idea of you know the shambling horde, and it goes back to what was said at the start about zombies being the perfect enemy because you don't have to empathize with them, you just have to kill them. You know, they're not, you have to shoot out their brain and then they're gone, you don't have to, and that's, that's what it figures as, that's how the structure works. And it's also a, a, originally in some of the Romero films as well, it's, it, was a, it was about race panic. These came out a, around the time of the civil rights marches and there was definitely a fear of the masses and a fear of, a, a fear of that sort of, yeah, the, the shambling horde, the idea that you can never empathize. The, what I was wondering, uh, asking the scientists and the game designers about is the implications of the fact that now, so in 1918 disease was still the great leveler, right? You could, anybody from any social class could get sick and die. But now if you look at particularly something like AIDS, which hasn't been mentioned, but is, you know, a, a massive part of people's cultural disease fear, something like AIDS, some, and in America really any disease, it's, there's massive class stratification of who's going to die and who isn't. And I was wondering if that's changing the way we're telling these stories. I would argue that's not true for any new disease. Mm. So if you take something like even flu in 2009, yeah. if you looked at a sort of histogram against social class who got it, 
I don't think it's any patterns. I mean, if you don't have the ability to go around the world and go on lots of holidays and meet lots of people, yeah. you're more likely to be safe. Uh, yes, just there. So a question for the scientists actually. Um, in your modelling, what have you found the sort of tipping points are, not in terms of lethality and incubation periods, etc., for when it would actually cause major society to break down? Uh, has that even been incorporated into the model? There's kind of a consensus about the features we would expect a pandemic mm -hmm. uh, virus or pathogen to have. Uh, luckily enough, all these features have never been found in the same uh, pathogen yet. Uh, uh, but uh, it's probably a question of uh, you know, time and probabilities. Part of what made H1N1 uh, significant was that it was targeting people in that 18 to 34 age range. These are not the people who are supposed to die of disease. And you can kill a much smaller segment of the population and have a huge impact on society if you are not targeting the very young and the very old, but targeting the working class, the people who we need to remain economically viable and functional. And so it's not just a flat number thing, it's also who is getting sick. Uh, gentleman in the middle back there. There's a very good possibility we'll go back to the days when disease was the great leveler, uh, where you know, a scratched thumb could spell death, whether you are you know, a billionaire or, or a pauper. I think viruses, bacteria will always be with us. Antibiotics, suppose they don't ever fail. There'll be something else. I think you can think of a time when there's no infectious disease to worry about. <laughs> That was cheery, wasn't it? <laughs> Being a scientist and studying disease and so forth, are you more fearful of disease or less fearful of disease? The next pandemic, chances are it's not going to be like 1918. It'll be like 2009. Um, and sort of realising actually the vast majority of viruses do nothing to us. Probably no point worrying about something you have no control. So uh, that's probably what you learn. It's probably not what you want to hear from the scientists. <laughs> so making plague it made me feel less worried about it, I think, just because I realised it was actually very hard for all of humanity to be wiped out in one go. Now, something could wipe out 20%, 50% maybe, but to wipe out the entire world, I had to really bias it in, in favour of the player and really help the disease out. So that made me feel a bit more positive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming along. Let's have a hand for our panel as well.